I told you that I would never come to you, at least I hope to never have to come to you, asking you for any money for me. Done it once before for someone that was in, in, in great need. And I'm coming to you again, asking you to donate whatever you can. This is not for me. This is not for someone individually, or should I say not for one single person. This is for a brother named Brother Reverend Abraham. It's not even for him. He is part of a group called Hope in Hope India Missions. And I'm going to share with you a video of him. He came to our church this past Sunday and just thoroughly touched our hearts. And I want you to, if you can, to help. I'm going to put a link in the description. But his story is such to where he started off in southern India. I think India might be the largest con population wise on the uh, in the nation or in the world. But he goes from the southern part of India to the northern part of India as a missionary. And we don't really uh, think that there's a lot of Christian persecution there, but it is, even amongst Buddhists. And he's going to tell you stories about how his life was in danger, how they tried to kill him uh, a few different times, and how this mission was birthed out of two ladies, two Americans, I think they were Americans, I'm not sure, maybe from England, but two ladies who were there as nurses for 30 years without one single convert but they continue to push and continue to push and then he shows up there and then after 10 years of him being there only three or four i believe is the number of people that that uh, actually place their faith in christ now it's growing and even with the persecution it's still growing and so this is where you guys are going to have the ability to come in and to help before we play let you all hear from him let me just go to uh the website this is hope india missions and just go to the website I'll, again i'll drop a link in the in the description as well but i also want you to kind of meet him who he is his name is dr reverend ea abraham and i want you guys to meet who he is before he comes up this is uh reverend dr ea abraham and just to hear his story and what he's doing honestly ladies and gentlemen it is a blessing it is wonderful to hear what he's doing there uh, many of us would not do the same thing. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of us have to have a hard time going out and evangelizing and being witnesses in our own neighborhoods. He left his hometown and ventured probably twice uh, the distance uh, of two Americas. He went there and he is having some success, but he needs our help. And so he's going to tell you more about it. I think he says $100 would pay for one pastor there, uh, $10,000 would would help for one church to be built. And I would love to know that we are doing our part. I've contributed. If you go to contribute as well, it, they, it won't see anything having to do with this channel or me. It would just have you contributing. And I think that's the way God kind of wants it. No one is getting any kind of glory or any kind of um, notoriety from this. It's just that human beings who have a passion for the Lord, who want to see other people coming to Christ in other countries, Buddhists and Hindus and so forth coming to Christ, in this case, Buddhists. And so I would love for you to have the opportunity to be a part of that. And so without further ado, i let you listen to uh, Brother Abraham now. He does speak, he is Indian. And so it's a little bit difficult in some cases to hear what he's saying, but I think still you probably will be able to understand what he's saying. And I think you'll definitely be able to get the message. So without further ado, Brother Abraham. Thank you, Pastor, for accepting me. And, uh, I was really blessed many of you came and greeted me and uh, hopefully we'll have more time get to know each other and uh, I am Abraham, easy to remember, is right? Can you imagine my wife's name? Sarah, yes. <laughs> so there is no way to forget me, okay? Okay, thank you and appreciate your prayers. And uh, before I share, I wanted to show you a four minutes video so we get an idea about uh, what we are doing then i will talk to the further about the things so uh, i was born and brought up in southern part of india and as a teenager after my high school in india you know the high school is uh, 10th grade after that i need we need to pay money to go to the higher classes so i was uh, uh, wanted to study but no my parents did not have the money to send me to the college so my, you know, my uncle who called me to another uh, big city in India called the Bangalore, the high-tech people from India were coming from there. So I was, went there. Uh, so I was so eager to continue my education. 
But uh, you know, the one year passed. My uncle didn't send me to the college. He put me in a grocery store. Then uh, one and a half year over, two years over, I could not do anything. I got so distressed and discouraged. My friends who have continued the studies two years, now I moved from my small village to the higher big city, spent two years and without seeing, doing anything, going back and feeling, facing my friends, that was a big challenge to my life. And I was really feeling shameful and not seeing what to do further. Finally, I came to a conclusion to commit suicide. And uh, so I was planning to jump in front of the running train and kill myself and uh, waiting for all the day. Then the evening came. The five o'clock was my train. And uh, then uh, waiting for the train timing. I didn't go for the work. I was sitting and crying and going through all the emotions. And before I go to the train track, I thought, too good to write a suicide note. So I was brought up in a Catholic church. My grandfather was a Catholic. He came to the Lord and he was reading the Bible, putting the Bible here and there. And underneath the Bible, there were some paper. So I went to pick up a paper, lift the Bible in my hand. I heard a voice, my son, open and read it. It was so clearly the voice from above. I had no idea what is going on. So I just went out and opened the door, make sure nobody is watching me. And I didn't see anybody, so I thought something psychologically affected my mind. I had to write and go, otherwise I will miss the train. Second time when I was trying to take the paper, lift the Bible, I heard the same voice, my son, open and read it. So second time I felt it, this is something from the Lord. I had no idea where to read as a big Bible. This is a small Bible, travel Bible, but the, usually the Bible is so big. Here. And uh, <clears throat> just open, I got the verses from... Book of Ecclesiastes 7, 16 to 18. It's a wonderful passage. Ecclesiastes 7, 16 to 18. And it says that uh, the first question, why do you destroy yourself? Then it says, don't be over wicked. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Verses 18 says, it is good to grasp this and not to remove your hands. One who fears God will avoid all extremes. This, you know, when the Lord wants to talk, He has many ways to talk to you, to me. And that is a audio where the voice directly asks me, why die before your time? Today I am alive because of that big question. The Lord asked me, why die before your time? Even I could come and stand here, this is because of that big question. The Lord asked me, why die before your time? And uh, then I just knelt down and I prayed, Lord, if you love me, take care of my life. After that prayer, the room was filled with brightness. I don't know how long I was there. And uh, I forget about committing suicide, forget about the train timing. And supernaturally, the Lord uh, saved my life. And that's the way I, the Lord helped me to, next slide please, to the, um, uh, to the Lord. And the Lord saved my life with a great purpose. And uh, that you will see as the passage is going on. Before uh, I share this one, I want to share this story. In the year 2000, the Lord enabled me to go to Australia. And that was a big conference. I am not a Baptist. That was a Baptist conference. Somebody recommended. The Lord opened the way. I went there to attend the conference. Few Indians were there. Two old sisters, they were searching. Is anybody from Bihar here? The state, North India is called Bihar, which is known as the graveyard of missionaries in India. So uh, they asked, anybody from here? They were looking around. Finally, they came to me and uh, asked me where you are. I said, I am in Siwan. Okay, what is going on there? I said, 10 years, no, nobody came to the Lord. After 10 years, three people. Now in another six years time, we have about 30 people. That's what the people we are having. Then they asked, do you have any photos? So those days, no smartphone, no. People were carrying album. So I had the album with me. I gave the album to them. They were flopping and changing the pages, seeing the photos. And this lady is beginning to cry. 
I thought, what happening? Seeing the photos of Bihar state and the Australian ladies are crying. Then after a few minutes, one of the ladies just stood up and just she put her hands on my shoulder and she was crying like that. I was, she was so heavy and big lady. I was crushing like that. So I thought of instead of sitting, but to stand. So I stood up. Then the other lady came and she put the hands and this tall, two ladies were taller than me, the heavy, big ladies. And all their tears were rolling down to my head. I don't know what is going on. People were looking around. I also looking around what is going on. After a few minutes, they controlled their emotion. And then they came and then they said, somebody went to their call, the church, and give them a mission challenge. Go to the state of Bihar in North India, which is known as the graveyard of missionaries. And to go there, the best way to be, become a medical staff. So these ladies, they went to the nursing school, did their nursing, and then there is a hospital between Nepal and Bihar, in India. The, there is a hospital. So they went there and worked 30 years as a missionary nurse. They worked in the hospital, went to all these areas, tried to share the gospel. The city where I was, they know each and every nook and corner of that area. They work there. They know each and every place. And uh, so they worked 30 years. They could not see even a single person coming to Christ. They went back because they got old. They were sad. Then you know, the Lord sent me there before they die. I believe that. Before they die, just to show that your labor in the Lord is not vain. This morning, as the Harvest Bible Church, it's a very good name. We are yet to do the harvest. But see the many, many empty chairs. If somebody take up the challenge, like these ladies, to pray and commit for the church, all this chair will be filled. And the time will come to enlarge this building. Amen. And uh, so that's the place, the next slide. That's the slide, the place the Lord sent me as a missionary to go. As I said, the Lord saved my life from the suicide. Then I got to work enough. After some time in a post office, I was joining a church. I was growing and I was so enthusiastic, passionate. And doing whatever I can do in the church, doing my job. And I was thankful to the Lord because I thought getting a job in, in India, a government job means you feel so proud of that because very hard to get the government job. I thought the Lord blessed me because of that blessing I got this great big good job. I was continuing job. After six months, the Lord said, I saved you not to work in the post office but go to the place where the people never heard of my name. You know, that was a big challenge. And uh, I, I love the Lord. The same time I love my job. In our Christian life, we always suffer like that. You know? This is two things. Where to give the priority? I say, Lord, I love you. I love you so much because you saved my life. You gave me this job. But at the same time, I love my job because I want to help my siblings. I could not go to the college, but I can help my siblings do their higher studies. I want to help my parents. But the Lord said, be submissive, be obedient. That struggle went on three more years. After three years, the Lord, because of God's love, I quit my job and joined with a mission called Operation Mobilization. They teach how to live by faith. Then again, the Lord called and I said, my calling is to go to the place where the people never heard of the name as a missionary call. So I went to a Bible college and uh, in the Bible college, uh, 18 months training, giving how to reach out the people, plant churches where there is no church. Then I was, uh, uh, so after the end of the Bible college training, somebody came to the college and was giving a mission challenge. As in Australia happened, the same in the Bible college, sharing about the state of Bihar in North India. And... Uh, so uh, I am from here, the bottom of India, 
and Bihar is here. This is bottom to Nepal. This is one tenth of the Indian population lives here. Twenty percent of the people lives here. Two states have thirty percent of Indian population. Even today, less than one person Christian. You know what's the population of India? One point four billion. We just beat at China. We are the India is the the highest populated country, and the thirty percent of people here without knowing Christ. So, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so the pastor who came giving a vision challenge. This is the Bihar. It's not as the graveyard of missionaries. No life security. No electricity. No living facility. No so uh, no roads, and people are so violent. But without gospel, there is no transformation. Who will pray and who will go? And that's a missionary student. And uh, I was challenged by hearing that one. Then I begin to pray, Lord, please send someone to Bihar. After a few weeks, the Lord said, "Not someone. You must go." I was so totally scared. Then I went to the pastor and asked the pastor, "The Lord is calling me to go to Bihar. Please pray and send me." The pastor said, "Ebra, take some more time and pray because the pastor did not want to take the risk because once you go to Bihar, there is no guarantee that you will come back." So that's what he was scared of praying for me. And two, three ordinary church people, believers, prayed over me and sent me as a missionary. So always I tell the church people, we all are anointed by the Lord. You are called by the Lord. And whenever any opportunity comes, any opportunity comes for the glory of God, try to do it. Do it. I I thank God for those people. They were not pastors, but they got the courage to pray for me and bless me and send me as a missionary. The next time, please. So that's way. And uh, I went there in 1982 to North India. Then and, uh, uh, it was so hard. If one year I worked, <clears throat> I never got even a single person wanted to know about Christ. I never got a chance to sit with the people. To share the gospel, I was so discouraged. Like Jonah, I took my suitcase and ran away to the neighboring state. I thought I cannot do anything here after one year. So I was there in one year. Again, the Lord said, "Abraham, you are not in the right place." I said, "Lord, other than Bihar, I am ready to go anywhere." You know. But the Lord said, "I am with you. You go." Then I said, I took three days fasting and prayer. I asked the Lord, show me something, the people to accept me. I want to sit with them and talk with them. Then the Lord gave me a vision to start a school. And uh, I had the tenth grade education, never been a teacher, no administrative experience, no fund. But the Lord saying, start the school. Then the Lord gave me the promise from the book of Ezekiel, that it says, so, be ready and get ready. That the word came. I said, Lord, I am ready, but uh, I don't know how it is going to happen. And then I again prayed and committed. Then I said, Lord, if I want to start the school, help me to join with somebody starting a new school where I can get the basic training. So then, after that, one of my friend wrote me a letter and said, uh, <clears throat> Abraham, you are asking me to, to wanted to start a school. I am going to start a school. Why don't you come and join with me? So you can learn, and also he wanted somebody's help, so he can help me. That's what exactly I was praying for. So I went there and started the training for one year. Then I rented a building. The Lord raised a Muslim guy, furniture man. He said, "Okay, you take the furniture and give me money by installment." And uh, that's the way the school started. And the said, then I prayed for a hundred children. The Lord gave me hundred children within one month time, but that was not sufficient to manage. Then I pray, Lord, unless you give me forty more, I cannot manage. Within the second month, <clears throat> the Lord gave me forty-nine more, hundred and forty-nine children. School becomes self-supported. 
no income but just can manage but what i wanted to share this morning along with uh, my story our god when he's called you he has his own way to guide you step by step he's not going to tell you what is going to give you everything in advance but it takes you step by step amen today we have with seven schools and more than 3000 children and with <coughs> hindu muslim children come and study in our school what a great god be sir amen that what he says is not because of your ability because of your availability god can make your life in a greater things next one please next one so this is the was the life that time there now the lord has changed so much okay the next one please <coughs> brother uh, where is he okay so uh, the, the the state is known as the graveyard of missions that is the name which is given there and uh, <coughs> even the school begin to grow every day going out and preaching the gospel but it took 3 10 years to see somebody coming to christ we can imagine the hardship those sisters worked 30 years then the lord used me 10 years <coughs> 40 years to see some breakthrough in that place and today you know us the lord bless we have uh, more than 200 churches in 13 states of north india more than 20000 people worshiping jesus as the lord and savior so sometime this is your god is not uh, working according to your plan god works his own way he has his own plan his own master plan so you don't need to worry about yesterday we were talking so i was telling pastor we don't need to worry about it but we say lord what to see something in my life you know one day the 10 years time nothing was happening going through the hard time i was kneeling down and i was fasting and i pray lord many missionaries came and did the work and could not see anything but i wanted to see something happening in my life please help me then the lord well, that day i was reading the book of job job was saying even though my flesh will perish like this but i will see my redeemer with my own eyes i catch up that word and i said lord i wanted to see something happening with my own eyes i catch up that and keep on praying and praying and this means 5 years 6 years time again 3 4 years nothing happened then after 10 years three people came to the lord and none of them can read and write so i cannot give them a bible so i was going once in a week going and sharing the gospel with them trying to bring them up then after few weeks the village people came to know that these people are converting to christian faith then they said you no need to come to our village you know the passion after waiting 20 10 years this people so i was taking putting my life in risk going that village again and uh, the next week when i was getting ready my wife asked me can i come with you that was her first time coming to the outreach and she, i said they yeah, are come so she came because of her about 15 ladies were there and 10 gents were gathered about 25 people i was so excited because i got the big crowd to preach so i taught them a song and shared about christ love and had a good preaching i was so happy and i was and coming back and thanking my wife thank you for joining with me that because of you all these people came you know the people those who are opposing me for three people you can imagine how much happy they were no they were so upset and five of these people were waiting on the road covered their face and they all of a sudden caught me and two people catch hold of my both hands and one of the men removed a big knife and put to my stomach and my wife holding my hand holding and shivering i have two children both of them were very small that time and she was shivering bihar is known as the graveyard of missionaries and now that knife is here and wife is standing with me you can imagine the situation i humanly 
I was thought that my ministry is over. My grave was going to make it here now. I then after a few minutes I said, I uh, have. Did I do any wrong? Why do you want to hurt me? And the person was holding the knife was telling, Stop! Today is your last day of preaching. Hereafter you are not going to preach anymore. Okay. What to say further? Even I was getting ready both ways to, you know, I mean. Uh, then after a few minutes again I said, uh, If you have any conflict, why don't you come and talk to me tomorrow? See, I am standing with my wife. The gang leader standing behind me said, Okay, let him go. But the man who was holding the knife was telling, if you allow him to go, he will convert all the people. By all this talk, you know that putting the knife inside is a matter of one second. But the Bible says, unless the Lord permit, even a hair cannot fall from your head. Amen. Amen. So you no need to worry about the things, what you hear, what you say. Even in America, people generally say that, we don't want to offend anybody. But I want to encourage you, church. You are not offending anybody, but you are giving an opportunity to somebody. So whenever you get an opportunity, share the love of Christ, what the Lord has done in your life. That what book of Acts says, when the power, Holy Spirit come upon you, you will be my witness. No need to preach. You need to take the Genesis to Revelation to the people. Share your testimony. That's what the love people wanted to hear and make uh, that opportunity. The next one, please. Uh, yeah, so then the ministry began to grow little by little. Then after within another two years' time, 30 people came to the Lord. Uh, came to the Lord. One evening, six young people came to our house and uh, they were shouting and put, uh, making all the noise. And one of the men just took out his gun and was pointing to shoot me in front of my children and my wife. Again, the gun didn't work. So he got upset and went. The next day he met an accident and the Lord enabled me to take him to the hospital. Our God is a great God. Our life is in the hands of the Lord. Amen. So that's where the ministry continued to grow and uh, so many challenges, so many challenges. I was beaten up public place and my daughter was 13. They tried to uh, kidnap her and uh, their planning was to kidnap and rape and kill her. And now the Lord uh, protected her life. She did her masters in counseling and doing the ministry with me uh, in Bihar. And you know, and our God is a great God. And I want to say that, not to fear about the things, but trust in the Lord. Look to the Lord where your help is coming. That is our strength. The next one, brother. And uh, so uh, that uh, small beginning, now this school became high school. I have two schools. That's where the ministry. And we have a formal school, an informal school. There is a group called uh, uh, the rat-eating people, the poor community. Those children never go to the school. So we give them a one-time meal. That's where we bring the children and giving them education. And uh, without education, no transformation. That's the way we are trying to tell the leper children, we bring and do the things same way. So we have formal school and informal school, and that's the way we are trying to educate the people. Next one. And, uh, next one. So, uh, as I said, waited 10 years. Waiting on the Lord is not wasting your time. I want to say one more time. Waiting on the Lord is not wasting your time. God will do his things his own way. Can you imagine coming from all the way from Bihar, which is known as the graveyard of mystery, the hardest place, waited 10 years, nothing happened. Now we have 13 states and uh, more than 200 churches, 1,000 plus house churches. What the way the Lord is expanding. Yes, next one. And uh, this way we train the native people and send them out to reach out. You know, the way our churches are growing, we tell every believer to share the good news with other people. We say that uh, when you meet your friends, share your story, ask them, can I pray for you? And put your 
hands on the shoulder of your friend and pray. And prayer will give them peace. That makes them to want to know more about Christ. Gradually they will come to faith. I want to encourage each and every believer to do that one here. The next one. And uh, so these are our present ministries. We are a missionary organization. Our, uh, our focus is planting church. We reach the unreached and tell to the untold. That is our mission. So we are having, so we are having the Bible college, the mission, the orphanage, and different ways we are uh, running it. I know the time is going on. The next one. And uh, so the major challenge is persecution. Is still that is a big thing. A lot of churches have been persecuted things. A week ago, from a village, about 25 families came to the Lord. And they were growing happily. They put a small tent there, worshipping. And uh, you know the, the high caste, those who are opposing the gospel, they put fire on their houses. And 21 families, they lost everything. They are, this is the rainy season. They are putting the plastic and sleeping under the plastic now. So please remember and pray for that uh, villages and these people, how they are doing. Uh, and uh, this way, the many people, they have to pay a lot when they come to the faith. And still, in spite of persecution, the churches are growing. Praise God. Continue to pray for India. The next one. And uh, this is our goal for to build the, when we have 10, 15 house churches, then we build one church in the central place. That's called a central church. One church is cost about ten thousand dollar to build the church. And uh, God, our uh, next uh, aim is to we reach children and youth. That is our main focus. So we are aiming to reach fifty thousand children by twenty thirty. Please pray that the Lord would open the door and make sure it happens. And uh, one thousand market ministries. You know, the market ministries means equipping the, equipping the church people. Be a witness in their office, in their uh, workplace, wherever they get the opportunities. And uh, the Buddhism started in Bihar and that spread all over Asia. Please pray that uh, they come as a pilgrimage to Bihar as the Muslims go to Medina, Makkah, in Saudi Arabia. We Christians go to Israel the same way all this Buddhists, they come to Bihar. So to reach them, we want to put up a hotel there. That's the only way to reach them. So appreciate, uh, that's a big goal of doing it. So appreciate your prayers. Yeah, next one. So we need uh, continuous your prayers. Prayer move the mountains. You may not be able to come as a missionary to India. And India is closed the door. Foreign missionaries come and do anything as a missionary in India anymore. But your prayer can reach there. I was so encouraged to see that morning intercessory prayer, Wednesday prayer. Keep on praying. And please remember, we are also in your prayers so that we can reach more people. And uh, uh, this nation need to see Jesus. 33 million gods and goddesses in India. Do we need that much? India need the living God. We can redeem their life and give them eternal life. So will you join with me? Praying for India and the ministry. Hope India mission. We are the hope. Jesus is the hope for the world. And you and me are anointed to work as an ambassador to, to give this hope to the people. That's what the, we are committed to. Do that to ministry. That's the work we are doing. We appreciate your prayers. And really, we want to see the God's kingdom be expanded in all India. Especially the Christians are in South India. Only last 10, 15 years, the Lord is greatly moving in North India. And this is the time the Lord is moving. And your prayer can make a bigger dif difference. This morning, I am so glad to come and share these things with you. Whenever the things come to your mind, anything you see about India, any discussion, 
for any prayer time. Keep on praying for India. As a ministry, Harvest Bible Church, I want to say the Lord is going to bless your church. The Lord will do great things. Godly vision need humility. If you are proud, God cannot do anything. We need humility. Once in a month, take at least half day fasting. Come to the church and pray together. In the USA, people think that if you don't eat one time, they will die. You know. You are not going to die. Humbly come to the presence of the Lord. At least once in a month. Take your time. Pastor, please take this as a call for you. Then you will see a greater harvest here. The second thing, godly vision need passion. We need to have a passion to reach out by simply sitting here. Coming on Sunday, they will be coming here and praising God and going back. It's not going to make the church to grow. Every heart needs a passion. The perishing souls, your family, many may not know about Christ. Your friends do not know about Christ. That's what I said. Discuss with them, share. When you share your story, they will tell their story. Then you say that, I was going through that time. The Lord Jesus helped me. Can I pray for you? Join with them in prayer. Put your hands on the shoulder of your friend because you are anointed by the Lord. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. So I always teach in our church, we have got the anointing and the authority. Can you say that word? Anointing. Loudly. Amen. You need to believe that. And when you begin to do that, you will see the great work of the Lord in this church. The third thing I want to see, godly vision need determination. We need to have a goal. What is your goal for 2025? What do you want to see by the end of this year? What do you want to see by the end of next year? Make a goal, pray, work. When we begin to do things, the Lord will work with us. A lazy man cannot get anything. The people need to work. You and me are called to work. Jesus never called the lazy people as his disciples. He called the right people, hardworking people, passionate people. They came and they were the people made the history that 12 people changed the world this church I want to encourage you what, what was the first sentence I said godly vision needed humility the second one passion the third thing determination if you have these three things, this is godly vision. This morning, maybe the Lord sent me here to tell you that. Take up these three things. And you will see the pouring of the Holy Spirit. Many will come to this church to worship with you. Or are you want to stay like this? You want to stay at this? But just keep on seeing these empty chairs? Or you want to see the fullness of the Holy Spirit here? Let's humble ourselves. I hope you will take half day fasting and we'll come together to make it happen. God is going to bless you. Shall we pray close?